Russia has serious advantages when playing by 19th century rules of the game, especially vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And uh, it can and it will overplay European Union tactically in almost all concrete fightings, like in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine. <clears throat> it can lose strategically, but not tactically. And one of major reasons is that authoritarian regime can play much more effectively against uh, coalition. Uh, it can make decisions uh, in a fast way, and uh, it can play more, uh, more uh, decisively and uh, uh, more actively. And the fourth point is that uh, although Russia is disruptive power, uh, and uh, in, in uh, this uh, capacity, it can easily oppose any constructive play by any constructive strategy by uh, uh, the other side. And in spite of being much weaker than European Union, Russia can uh, overweight uh, uh, European uh, Union efforts in any, any part of the world, including uh, in Eastern neighborhood and uh, in uh, Balkans uh, underbelly. And that's very important issue. If only to play uh, against Russia, then uh, nobody can uh, wait for easy uh, victory. And uh, I would say that in many cases, the only way is to find uh, joint interests and uh, not to have Russia as the opposing opposing force. And this leads me to Balkans, <clears throat> which somehow can be compared to Caucasus, but somehow uh, post-Yugoslav space can be compared to post-Soviet space. And for a long while, uh, there were uh, uh, discussions that unlike uh, in Yugoslavia, in the Soviet Union, we've managed uh, to disintegrate uh, peacefully uh, without any uh, blood and so on. It looks now like <clears throat> Putin is overplaying the last act of the uh, Cold War play uh, when Russia is in a different position, in much stronger position, or it used to be, or it thought it is in more strong position, and uh, it uh, uh, leads to uh, the next uh, cycle uh, the next uh, part of the same spiral uh, when disintegration of the USSR, which used to be peaceful, <coughs> is repeated in a very uh, in a very different way. And we should have in mind when speaking about all this Slavonic Brotherhood, uh, special feelings between Russians, Serbs, uh, uh, Orthodox churches in different countries, and so on. We should have in mind that Russians and Ukrainians are. are in many cases, absolutely the same. And you can hardly define whether this or that person in Russian government, for example, is ethnic Russian or ethnic Ukrainian. It doesn't uh, mean that uh, uh, bloody conflicts uh, are, are impossible. And uh, uh, what we see now in Eastern Ukraine is, uh, uh, well, uh, the improvement of the fact that it's not about ethnic roots, it's not about uh, brotherhood, it's not about anything else, but due to different political reasons and circumstances, even uh, civil war can take place between <clears throat> brothers. And what we see in, uh, uh, re uh, with regard to Eastern Ukraine, it's that division can uh, come across families with uh, relatives uh, who stay in Russia or who stay in Eastern Ukraine and who stay in uh, the rest of Ukraine uh, becoming becoming enemies uh, due to uh, those events in eastern Ukraine, which uh, have been partly uh, provoked by Russia, but it would be too easy to explain these events just by uh, Putin's uh, wrongdoings. <clears throat> uh, frozen conflicts in post-Soviet uh, space are no more frozen. And uh, it's very important issue. Uh, we need to look at all these conflicts uh, altogether, not on separate conflicts, to understand that uh, A, there are tectonic moves connected with the fact that post-Soviet 
uh, period, if to speak about post-Soviet space, is over, and there is uh, development in uh, different directions, and this development in different directions is defrosting this conflicts and uh, will inevitably see uh, many more, unfortunately, will see many more uh, bloody continuations of these conflicts than uh, we are faced by uh, now. So Crimea could be seen as a latent conflict and uh, it didn't exist on the map of uh, frozen conflicts, but what we've seen in South Ossetia, what we've seen in Abkhazia, uh, and uh, there, there, there was an attempt, by the way, by Russia to find, to establish a good scenario to show the way how uh, post-Soviet countries should deal with Russia in order to avoid uh, uh, negative consequences connected with these frozen conflicts. And uh, Russia has tried this in Transnistria. It didn't happen due to European Union somehow intervention. Uh, Russia did try this in a very different way in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but we should keep in mind that earlier there was more positive from the Western point of view development in Ajaria, which could not happen without certain agreements between Russia and uh, Georgia, which later, or breaking of these agreements, later uh, led uh, to South Ossetia, uh, to, to Georgian way in 2000 uh, and 2008. Um, there is political logic uh, behind uh, uh, domestic political development and uh, I would explain it in, in such a way. In my view, 2014 was a very decisive year when Russia switched to very different trajectory and uh, the regime made uh, several choices which are irreversible, meaning that in my view, Russian political regime now, which is hostage of Putin, but, uh, hostage, uh, but Putin himself is hostage of decisions he made earlier, he, uh, the regime can be described as a plane in spin tail uh, and the trajectory cannot be changed from within. Uh, meaning that Putin himself, regardless of his intentions and ideas, cannot change trajectory of this development. And the basic decisions ma decision made by him was decision to switch from democratic uh, electoral legitimacy to military mobilization legitimacy, which uh, means uh, that, uh, uh, well, he should keep, well, he's very popular leaders, you know, due to this switch, and he fixed his problems connected with decline of uh, democratic legitimacy, which was going on earlier. But uh, uh, there are not so many means uh, how he can keep this high uh, military chieftain uh, legitimacy. One main is to demonstrate military victories, which is hardly possible after Crimea in uh, Ukrainian space. And uh, here Balkans, even if uh, being approached as underbelly, is uh, a very good, uh, well, uh, opportunity if only uh, the regime uh, will need to show some uh, failures of uh, the European Union, of the West, or victories of, uh, of Russia. The second uh, opportunity to keep uh, high legitimacy is rhetoric to keep rhetoric of a besieged fortress and to keep this confrontation at least in a, a rhetoric dimension is absolutely needed and what we see now uh, is absolutely uh, logical. And the third is repressions and we do see some <clears throat> uh, repressions which are already going on but it will continue. So my point is that there is no way for Putin to switch from military legitimacy to, to democratic legitimacy, and B, to keep this military legitimacy, he should uh, keep uh, going on in the, same, in the same direction, meaning that uh, Russia uh, will see uh, Balkans as uh, uh, the opportunity uh, somehow to compensate for uh, lack of victories or even losses in uh, post-Soviet space in competition with European uh, with the European Union. 
and here Balkans is very important because just like Crimea, you know, we can speak that Putin or Putin's regime or Russia under Putin annexed Crimea, but it's important to understand that uh, from the very beginning, Russians uh, in general considered Crimea to be more natural part of Russia than say Chechnya or some other Caucasian mm -hmm. republics. And as logical polls did show that a uh, big majority of Russians considered Crimea to be uh, part of Russia, many more than those who considered Chechnya to be, to be part of Russia. So what Putin did, he exploited these uh, feelings and he just reflected intentions and uh, ideas of Russian society. Not, uh, this is not only due to propagandist machine that uh, Putin's moves in uh, foreign policy are so popular in Russia. This is due to the fact that Putin plays very uh, well uh, populist, uh, in populist politics. And here, uh, as in many other cases, can overplay European politicians. And by the way, when speaking about the fact that Russian foreign policy is uh, not that strategic, we should have in mind that uh, uh, in case of Europe, it's less strategic in many cases. And Putin, as authoritarian leader who rules for almost for more than 15 years can uh, be much more coherent and strategic in his uh, uh, foreign policy than any of European leaders uh, who uh, think about forthcoming elections and the need to, to be, uh, be, be re-elected. So I would say that Crimea, in my view, is Viagra for the aging uh, Putin's regime. It did help uh, regime to increase essentially its uh, popularity, but at the same time, it led to a very serious, uh, uh, well, physical, economic, and many other problems. So I don't think that regime is capable to use this kind of medicine uh, often, and uh, not only due to the fact that uh, it's uh, physically very complicated, but due to the fact that there is nothing more uh, which can be compared to Crimea in, uh, well, uh, uh, Russian uh, mysterious soul. And uh, this puts uh, Putin in a very complicated uh, position as well. So to, to end uh, my uh, brief story, I would say that uh, we should not wait for any uh, serious changes of uh, the regime uh, under uh, present uh, leadership uh, in foreign policy as well as in domestic politics. And uh, as I did try to explain, this is not uh, so much due to inability of the regime uh, to uh, think uh, uh, about uh, uh, need uh, uh, to change, but it's about inability to change uh, trajectory. Regime is, uh, uh, well, uh, is a hostage of uh, those moves uh, uh, they did already make. Second, unfortunately, uh, if to, uh, in, in my view, the good news is that regime will not last for long. Political time is now uh, going very fast, meaning that, uh, in my view, they do have, uh, well, one and a half, two years, uh, and uh, 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 the problem is that if this is playing in uh, spin tail, uh, uh, tail spin, sorry, uh, if it's uh, such trajectory, then there are uh, two major uh, possible outcomes. One, uh, collapse before meeting the ground, which I would uh, uh, describe in politological terms as very essential transformation of the regime, which is possible only if to replace the leader. Uh, the regime is designed in such a way that it's very complicated to replace the leader, but, well, if only they will manage, there will be uh, this transformation, which uh, can hardly lead to uh, better uh, uh, foreign policy. The second way, uh, the second uh, outcome can be collapse when the plane meets the ground. And uh, this is very uh, serious and very risky development due to the fact that there are no political institutions in the country, almost no political institutions. There are almost no uh, politicians uh, which, uh, who do have uh, any kind of legitimacy independent from Putin's. 
meaning that will be chaos, and in this chaos, uh, something new can uh, appear, and uh, the power can be taken by the uh, small but well-organized force, and uh, I would not exclude, well, and this is for sure that uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, which, who is the second personalistic leader in the country. In Russia, we do have two personalistic regimes, one of Putin, and one of Kadyrov, they are independent from each other, although they do depend from each other, but not uh, control each other, I mean. And Kadyrov is a very serious player who expands now, and what we see now is a huge conflict between him and uh, FSB, which can lead to very negative uh, consequences, including in foreign policy. And uh, the third option is that a regime will get a kind of uh, shock from outside which will help it uh, to change trajectory. So they cannot change trajectory from within, but they can wait for something important to take place outside to change this trajectory and to avoid this, uh, uh, well, collapse in, in near future, and it can be collapse in Ukraine, both political and economic. It can be switch of uh, European attention from uh, Ukraine to some more important issues like Greece, disintegration of the EU, and so on. And uh, in my view, Putin's calculation is pretty easy. It's connected with the fact that he thinks, and Russian political class in general, uh, that uh, rules of the game are changing. And the one who will violate existing rules of the game, the first, will benefit more than anybody else. So if this is right, and if rules will change, then uh, their gambling will lead to positive results from their point of view. If not, uh, uh, they will fail, but uh, I don't think that uh, uh, well, serious leaders, uh, Russian leaders including, can think about a large-scale confrontation with the West for a long while. So they cannot count on more than a year, a year and a half uh, uh, continuation even of those san sanctions which do exist, not to speak about uh, intensification of these uh, sanctions. So their calcul calculation is much more short-term and uh, I I'm sure that in two years from now we'll see very different uh, picture both in terms of Russian political regime, uh, uh, its uh, relations uh, with Europe, and hopefully Western Balkans will remain uh, without uh, without any serious involvement from Russian side. But uh, it's it's going on. Uh, South Stream is is over. But uh, yesterday there was a report that uh, Mr. Timchenko, one of uh, closest Putin's uh, friends, is continuing his. Uh, uh, pipeline construction uh, there, and uh, I, I, I do think that Russia is very effective in some cases. It's uh, effective in rent distributing and in exporting some commodities, and corruption is one of these commodities. So Russia is very effective in uh, exporting corruption, and this is not due to the fact that Russia is that bad, but it's due to the fact that, well, human beings are similar in different parts of the world, at the West as well as at the East. And uh, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, Western leaders corrupt, uh, well, or corrupted by, by Russia, and uh, this, this will continue. And Western Balkans, I think, is a good place, not only in terms of uh, some uh, potential conflicts which uh, can uh, uh, activize and which can make uh, the life of European Union much less happy than even now, and attention to uh, Ukrainian events much less uh, serious than it's now. But uh, uh, and th this uh, is uh, not very uh, uh, well. Uh, not very, this uh, doesn't need uh, any, any serious investment from uh, Russian, Russian side. That's why my, uh, last, uh, my last appeal is to think about how to, uh, well, not to uh, cooperate with the regime, but how not to 
uh, will uh, lead uh, to a more intensive confrontation where resources of Putin's regime are uh, very serious and how to think in terms of containing uh, its uh, uh, expansion and uh, letting it to, to be active uh, in post-Soviet space uh, rather than uh, in uh, post-Yugoslav space. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I, um, I think if, if nothing else, you've certainly set the bar high for uh, one of the sound bites of the day um, with the Viagra and Crimea. Um, moving on, Sveta. Thank you, James. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. It's always lovely to come back to the LSC and have a chance to discuss Southeast Europe. But I'd like to also echo the most comment from the opening session that it's really, it's really good chance to expand our discussion and, and hear more about the people who study Russia because um, it's been very instructive for me to hear the presentation this morning and reflect on that from the perspective of someone who studies Southeast Europe and I think we can only benefit from more cross area studies discussions such as this one. But as I said, I'm someone who has studied and researched the, the Balkans, so my presentation will inevitably focus on, on the Balkan perspective of post-conflict, um, of Russia's post-conflict influence in the region. So what I aim to do in a concise, as concise presentation as I can deliver is take stock of um, Russia's uh, influence during the conflicts in the Balkans, its post-conflict strategies, and then uh, finish with um, overview of the lessons learned from the experiences. Perhaps not so much the lessons learned for Russia, and we've heard already a little bit about that and how the Balkans, in particular Kosovo example, has been used in Russia's foreign policy, but maybe more the lessons learned for the Balkans, for the countries in the Balkans, and the lessons learned from the current um, uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis and what the Balkan states can take from that. So to start with um, Russia's influence during the conflicts uh, in the Balkans. Um, Russia, at the, end of, uh, at the beginning of the 90s, had the means and, and had more or less the interest to intervene in the Balkans. Had the means as, because by virtue of being a member, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, um, was involved uh, in uh, the negotiation efforts in the uh, resolving of the conflicts in Bosnia, in Kosovo, and so on. So it had a voice it could use. It had interest, perhaps not as much as, because the Balkans is a very important, a crucial region for Russian foreign policy but because it also gave Russia an opportunity to um, take part in um, multilateral in initiatives um, which, from which it could only benefit because it could use them as a good examples of cooperation with its Western partners, but also domestically perhaps, as was suggested earlier today, as a means of saying that it can protect its friends and, and advance its own national interest. Now, from the countries in the Balkans, from the Balkan perspective, Russia's input in these um, conflict resolution efforts that were going on in different um, countries in the former Yugoslavia, um, there is really no consensus as to how beneficial this was. Obviously, some countries and some leaders in particular would find Russian uh, input more welcome than others. But I think overall we can say why, well, Russia's participation uh, in conflict resolution may have uh, made resolving this conflict less straightforward. I think it certainly made them a little bit more balanced um, in the sense that different perspectives and different interests were considered when drawing up solutions. These solutions may have not ended up more efficient as, or as efficient as some people wished, but they definitely represented more perspectives from the ground as well as internationally when resolving them. So while they're not as efficient, hopefully some of them will prove to be more lasting. So in that sense, I think, at least I'm inclined to think as Russia's um, 
input into conflict resolution during the 90s as a relatively unbalanced positive input in the region. Um, certainly, I think at least some of the solutions would have been less sustainable had there not been um, Russian influence during the, the drafting of these solutions and the, <coughs> and the political systems in the region afterwards. However, I'm not sure we can say that during the post-conflict period, um, Russia's influence was equally positive. Well, first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to posit that Russia's post-conflict strategies and initiatives in the region have been very different from those of the EU and NATO, and in a sense, less, much, much less involved and much less successful. Um, Post-conflict reconstruction in the Balkans, um, especially in the countries such as in countries such as Bosnia and Kosovo and Macedonia, has actually provided the European Union and NATO an unprecedented access into these countries, um, political systems, political institutions, and the trajectory they took after the after the conflict was over. So, in that sense, it was <coughs> mostly. Um, representatives of the EU and NATO who sat at the tables with domestic leaders and drafted constitutions, institutions, and how these institutions were meant to be working in the complicated and the complex post-conflict uh, context. Not only that, um, furthermore, the European Union in particular was much more successful in tying the success of these post-conflict um, systems, post-conflict institutions to some, um, well, in particular to EU membership, to the EU accession process, but to some rewards in future and incentivizing countries in the region to um, uphold these uh, uh, post-conflict solutions, which may have seemed unstable at the beginning, but were can woven into the, the, politi the political and foreign policy um, relations with the EU. So in that sense, the EU has become not so much an external as also an internal actor in the post-conflict um, politics in the Balkans. And um, this cannot really be said for Russia, because Russia, A, did not offer much in terms of uh, post-conflict political reconstruction, institution building, and so on, but also in terms of material assistance. And we all know that a lot of the EU's appeal often comes down to um, the access to funds, the access to other types of material and technical assistance to which these countries, especially in the difficult immediate post-conflict period, um, aspire to and, and needed a lot of. So with the lack of these two factors, after, despite having a um, presence during the conflict resolution period, Russia actually failed to capitalize on it, if you can call that capitalize, in the post-conflict period, which, which left Russia much less influential, especially in these post-conflict um, post countries. Um, if you look at, and I'm not an economist, and I really don't know very much about um, trade relations between countries in the Balkans and Russia, but it seems to me that um, it's not the post-conflict countries that have the strongest economic links to, to Russia. Um, if you look at the countries in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, most of where conflicts took place, they, do not have, they have not benefited that much from Russian investment, Russian trade, and so on. Say Bulgaria next door, um, seems to have much stronger economic links, much more of Russian investment flowing in and so on, um, rather than, than neighboring countries um, in the Balkans which experienced conflict. So um, with the lack of economic sort of levers and the lack of more political and less normative and, and normative appeal, Russia's role in the post-conflict period sort of steadily declined in these areas. Now that's not to say that um, especially after Putin took office in Russia, there has not been admiration from some of the local leaders for the style of leadership, for the kinds of policies that Putin um, implemented in Russia. But overall, um, that has not translated necessarily into Russia's um, political influence in these countries. 
And um, in that sense, it is, I suppose, not very surprising to say that um, the occurrence of conflict situation of antagonisms, ethnic or other antagonisms in Russia's own neighborhood in um, Ukraine and so on, is actually likely to lead to an even smaller role of Russia in the Balkans. Not necessarily and only because Russia, Russia is now, so to say, busy uh, sorting out conflicts in its own um, in its own backyard, but also because I think um, the whole experience has provided the Balkan states with um, kind of a new view, novel look onto how um, Russia operates. In, in foreign policy and internationally, and not all of these lessons that have been learned are necessarily positive for local political elites. And I think um, I'd like to offer sort of three accounts as to why, three explanations types of as to why Russia's policy, Russia's influence on Balkans policy, uh, foreign policy, and post conflict trajectories is likely to continue declining. The first are moral, then they're economic and political reasons. Um, the previous speaker discussed Crimea as a, as a conflict issue, as a conflict, new conflict zone, or different type of conflict emerging now in, in Russia's um, neighborhood. And um, I think it's very interesting to kind of reflect how uh, political elites and populations in the Balkans look at this um, at this case. Now, obviously, there there is no consensus at political level as to what Crimea actually is, how legitimate, legitimate, legal or illegal under international law Russia's annexation is, or as how just or unjust it is in the wider scheme of things as to who gets to um, change borders, change regimes in different countries and so on. And while for a lot of people political leaders in particular, but populations as well in the Balkans, there is a sort of this real politics argument still have a lot of appeal. Um, and people, some people see this as well, you know, if certain Western powers can go on and violate international law, certainly Russia should have at least as much um, right or might to, to do it. and. and and it's probably, <coughs> excuse me, just as well that it's not just, let's say, Western powers who can do it, but there's someone else to balance, um, balance them out. However, I think that is a more, that's the more superficial um, explanation, more superficial argument, and um, all the one that has received a lot of media and attention and coverage. I think the kind of deeper and more valuable lessons that people and political leaders in the, in the region got to us that, um, well, technically it showed them how, not how Russia is different or the same from other big powers, but how Russia, like other big powers, is different from them as small states. So basically for any leader, any member, citizen of a small state, and that's most of the states <coughs> in the Balkans, this only demonstrates what can, what can happen to small states when they get on the wrong side of, of, of a big power. And that Russia is not necessarily their friend, but Russia is an, yet another <coughs> large power who can use or abuse international law and norms to its own advantage or disadvantage, while small states in the Balkans can't do that. And um, while no one openly necessarily articulated this argument that, look, we are a tiny little state, perhaps an NATO member, perhaps not, because some Balkan states are not yet members of NATO. Um, this could happen to any one of us. Um, Ukrainians certainly didn't predict this happening to Ukraine. Maybe some did, but it was not widespread expected something to happen like Crimea. So um, perhaps Russia was not someone who was standing up there for international law and, and legal norms but someone who was another big power who was just waiting for the right opportunity to use its, to use its power, which I think has kind of created 
a, a moral distance between these, between the Balkans and Russia, because um, we're certainly talking about two different types of actors in, in international relations, and I think people in the Balkans definitely are more aware of that now than they were before Crimea and Ukraine happened. On to the economic reasons. I think these are probably more obvious in terms of Russia's declining economic um, performance, especially following the EU-Russia sanctions regime that started last year. So clearly the Russian economy has suffered. Obviously, the European economies have suffered too. But um, Russia has been unable and is unlikely to become more able in the near future to offer economic um, kind of <coughs> incentives for, to, to Balkan states um, <coughs> to bring them closer or to use them in one or, uh, or another way, such as an entry point in the European Union, as we discussed this morning. <coughs> With the freezing or cancellation of, the, of projects such as South Stream, I think um, there, is, there is very little right now that is on offer that seems appealing to Balkan leaders when looking at Russia as an economic kind of alternative to, um, to the European Union. Granted, the European economies are not performing as well as they used to before the crisis, but certainly Russia doesn't appear to be the alternative. Um, whereas, um, which you can see reflected in you know, the kinds of economic relations the Balkan leaders are trying to, to forge, um, mostly with China, Middle Eastern countries, but Russia does not necessarily rate as high. It's also unclear as to how much, and I'd like to hear actually probably the next panel more, as to how, many, how much did anyone in the Balkans really benefit from the whole EU sanctions, um, especially the non-member states such as Serbia who did not uh, follow the EU's uh, stand on imposing sanctions on Russia. There was a lot spoken about this at the beginning when sanctions were imposed as to how much um, a Serbian or other economies can benefit by replacing EU imports, but I'm not sure that the balance at the end of the year at this, in these countries actually showed that much um, benefit from this. So as I said, the economic arguments appear to be very, very weak. And finally, this is where I like for that finish, is um, <coughs> Russia's political influence. Political in the sense of, well, kind of a crossover between power and, and normative appeal. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, at the leadership level, the elite level, there is undeniably some, some attraction to the Putin model, to some leaders in the, in the region and some tend to emulate some of his tactics and would like to be able to um, maintain sort of similar, similar types of political tactics and legitimation strategies such as Putin uses. However, and, and at the popular level, again, there is some sympathy as to what Russia maybe stands for, or people perceive that Russia stands for. But I think the true test for this is um, looking at how populations in the Balkans react to the appeal on the one side of the EU and the other side of Russia. And I think in this sense, it's pretty clear that um, the EU model, not only the normative kind of democratic human rights and, and uh, <coughs> other values that the EU stands for, but also kind of the kind of society that people would like to live in is much closer to the EU than to Russia. And you can see it, if nothing else, if, reflected in the numbers of the people who emigrate from the region. Very few go to Russia. Most of them go and try to emigrate in the EU. And regardless of what they, what they say about EU policies or foreign policies and Russia's foreign policies, to me that signals that if they, ha if they could choose what, what kind of society they'd like to live, they would choose the EU model. They wouldn't choose Russia. So, and despite of EU's own deficiencies, and despite of EU's, um, uh, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, kind of reluctance about the pace and the end point of the enlargement process at this stage, it still appears 
to be a politically at the elite and the popular level as the kind of model where these societies are heading. So even if Russia opened its borders, I doubt many people from the Balkans would actually show up to, to go to emigrate there. And that, I suppose, is, is where I'd like to end. And I'll be happy to discuss any of these points with you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sveta. Um, we now have um, about half an hour or so um, for questions. So I'm going to open up the floor. Um, I see a number of hands going up. Um, I'm going to give first take to people who haven't already asked a question. Um, so the lady there, please. <laughs> Uh, my name is Barbara Fry. I'm the managing editor of Transitions Online magazine in Prague. Um, I haven't heard anyone talk or, or speculate about the possible influence of the Russian native language media project in the Balkans. And I believe Serbia is the first major effort in that respect. Uh, um, Nikolic met with some top editors from, I think, Sputnik recently and welcome the other side. So when we're talking about um, civilizational models and impressions of the Balkan, people in the Balkans toward Russia versus the EU, does anyone care to speculate about what that media project is going, to, what effect it might have on that issue? Okay. Um, lady there. Thank you. I'm Tomila Lankina, London School of Economics. My uh, question is to Ms. Konezka. You made a very interesting observation of the, on the Crimea effect, namely that the perception in this state might be that, well, could it be us next time? So I wonder whether you've seen any public opinion surveys showing this shift in Russia's soft power, its attractiveness um, among the Balkans. Thank you. Um, I have two more I'm going to take for this round. Um, right at the back, the Serbian ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Koneska mentioned the economic cooperation between uh, Serbia and EU. And uh, I would like to, to make just a few comments about this. Uh, I think it's uh, very important. Obviously, it's a very difficult time for Serbia. and. The economy is very important link between EU and Serbia. I would like to inform you that more than 60% of the trade uh, goes uh, between Serbia and EU. So, you know, trade exchange of Serbia, you know, it's 60, more than 60% goes to EU and I think 20% to countries which are candidates for EU. But this is the not only reason why these uh, links are very strong between Serbia and the EU. Another reason is regional cooperation. You know, after the terrible wars during the 90s, you know, uh, EU means uh, to regional countries and to Serbia much more than in other areas of Europe. It's not only a better uh, life, it's not only institutions, it is about reconciliation, the process of reconciliation which, which Europe uh, supports so much. And uh, the reasons why we are heading towards EU as a Serbia is obviously the issue of values. And again, it's about democracy, reconciliation. So three very important reasons why you, you mentioned this uh, rightly, why Serbia is so uh, on this road to, to EU. Of course, on the other side, we would like to keep our good relations with Russia because of the history, because of the culture, uh, religious, factors, uh, but our strategic role is EU. And just a, a one small sentence uh, about the, the last elections in Serbia. I think we have a really unique case in Europe, which, which uh, out of 250 MPs in the parliament, all of them are pro-EU. Of course, that's not necessary. That's necessary. Society is for EU. You know, the last, last year, public, public trade shows that more than 55, 70, 70 percent Thank you very much, very much. Thank you very much. We'll be dealing much more on the economic issues in the next panel. So I'll just take one more question from the gentleman there, please. 
Arion proceeds from the emotion of Brussels, which is the present perspective of the plans, I guess. I guess. Um, um, James, James, I'm making very, very much of a commercial comment. comment. Um, um, there are there fundamental, are fundamental politi political and legal differences, differences between, between an international, international coordinated, coordinated sanction sanction process, process in the case of cases uh, which culminate uh, in Kosovo and, 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 and the case of the Crimea. Crimea. I mean, that's been mentioned much throughout the day today. today. Uh, Kosovo uh, is a in this case, case and, and there are many, many factors, but I'm going to mention very, 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 very just, uh, just a few. A few. One, one was it was a benefit to a new member of former Yugoslavia, and it was a result of of a violent violation of Russian country that no longer exists. Then we had had a cleansing which triggered the NATO intervention and which placed it under also placed under the UN administration. But let's not forget also the there was a UN, UN um, um, process, uh, uh, negotiation process, to which Russia was also part of that international contact group, which recommended the uh, independence as the only viable solution. So, uh, saying that Kosovo uh, broke international law, it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's a false argument, which actually was confirmed by the International Court of Justice ruling as well. So, uh, any attempt to draw similarities are not even successful in uh, building up a strongman argument because uh, su such an argument requires for the audience to be ignorant or um, not informed about the original uh, argument. And um, I strongly agree with uh, uh, Dimitar Bechev's um, 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 earlier um, statement in which he said that Russia's policies towards the region, towards the Balkans, are a reflection of um, its relationship with the West. And we should see it in... in Thank you very much. Um, so we've got a few questions, uh, several obviously important comments. Um, Nikolai, maybe if you would like to go first. Uh, okay, I'll be pretty brief. Uh, I think that in case of Kosovo, there is huge difference between lessons taught and lessons learned, or at least lessons the West uh, thinks uh, were taught and uh, lessons Russia things uh, it, uh, it learned. And uh, we can speculate about uh, many different uh, uh, peculiarities of Kosovo, its uniqueness and so on, but uh, in general, what Russian political class learned is uh, that uh, the might is right, and uh, if uh, uh, you need to break certain uh, rules of the game and uh, you do have might to do this, you are welcome. And this is exactly what has been formulated by Putin in 2008 in advance of uh, uh, the war in Georgia and so on. And, uh, well, we can speak uh, uh, many hours about the fact that Kosovo doesn't have any uh, similarities with Crimea and so on. Well, Putin thinks, and uh, uh, it's uh, shared by uh, many Russians, that uh, it's absolutely the same. It doesn't mean that they were not, uh, well, uh, there were intentions by, uh, well, people uh, inside the region. There was, uh, uh, it wasn't agreed uh, with uh, the state uh, where this region uh, uh, belonged to. And, uh, well, there are many, many other, uh, many other uh, things which, uh, well, uh, led to further discussions for diplomats, but uh, generally speaking, uh, what has happened in 2008 uh, in Russian-Georgian relations and what has happened in 2014 in Russian-Ukrainian elections can be seen partly as direct consequence of what has happened in uh, 2008 in, in Kosovo. Not to speak about domestically driven uh, foreign policy and, uh, and so on. And uh, 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 my next point is about soft uh, power and hard power. And I think that in 2014, uh, the choice in favor of hard power, when Russia uh, was uh, uh, unable to uh, win uh, in the Ukrainian case using its soft power, uh, means that uh, Russia lost a lot of soft power. When using hard power, you cannot switch back to soft power for, for a very long while. And Balkans, perhaps, is one of those regions where this loss is uh, not that evident and where Russia can still, uh, uh, well, uh, exploit uh, certain, uh, certain soft power. We do see that due to economic reasons, Russia cut off uh, 
many of propagandist projects uh, connected to Russian world, uh, expanding of uh, Russia today and so on, but uh, I, I would uh, wait for uh, uh, Russian foreign policy uh, uh, to, to, to keep uh, being active uh, in Balkans because if only Russia can count on uh, using exploiting soft power, then Balkans is uh, the best uh, region to do so. Thank you. Sveta. Well, just briefly, I'm not going to comment on the Kosovo versus Crimea legal status. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of differences, though. But just briefly to, to the Serbian ambassador, I, I agree completely. I think that well, that was the point that I was trying to make, that the economic links between Balkan states and Russia are rather weaker than we would expect, given all the, all the talk about Russia's growing influence or seeking ways to use Balkan states as an entry or a point or in other instrumental ways um, to affect European Union policies. So it is actually the EU which, one way or another, through post-conflict kind of intervention, the EU accession process has managed to tie these countries much closer to itself rather than Russia, which is inevitably reflected in your the trade balance, as you mentioned, 60% is between of, of Serbia's trade is with the EU and then with the rest of the, the accession states, which is not that surprising. Um, on the issue of the small states in public opinion surveys, I did not base that argument at all on public opinion surveys. I, I haven't seen any. I think it would be very good if we can actually survey uh, public opinions and how they've changed regarding Russia in the past year and whether Crimea and what happened there has actually had any effect on how the people perceive it. But what I um, based this on is um, the um, kind of still persistent anxiety in many of these countries in the Balkans regarding their own statehood and sovereignty. And when I said this could happen next to us, I did not mean necessarily being annexed by Russia. Obviously, none of them share uh, share borders with Russia. But I meant, you know, um, having their own statehood under question and their own sovereignty. And there are many areas in the Balkans where, where you know, statehood is still contested right now. So, um, which I guess illustrates that um, these countries, these governments would need to rely on different means um, and tools when addressing these problems rather than the tools used by Russia or other bigger powers. And I suppose that basically exposed the stark difference between what is available to small states and what is available to big states. And just one sentence on them the native language media projects. I am actually not aware as yet of, of <coughs> any of these projects. And I think um, it's not a bad idea given, obviously someone in Russia thinks that there is a need to, ex to um, increase their you know, media presence and to extend their message to the region. I, what I would say though is that given the media culture in some of these, in a lot of these countries in Balkans, perhaps these can be very successful um, and media projects in, in the sense that um, they could come to, to support or maybe hopefully in some cases undermine the official message that is reproduced to the media in, in Balkans. Okay, I'll take another round of questions. Um, did, did you? Yeah. Right, so David Madden. Thank you. Um, David Madden, CSOX. Um, I see the title of this session is Russia and Conflict Resolution in the Balkans. I mean, looking at the situation now, I mean, fortunately, we don't have armed conflict, but we have a lot of conflict in terms of unresolved issues. Um, and I regret to say that I don't see that Russia has much interest in resolving any of those issues. So actually, conflict resolution isn't on the Russian agenda at the moment. Would you agree with that? Timothy. Maybe to echo some of those points and to link up to what Svete underlined that Russia is the UN Security Council permanent member. Uh, it's also member of many other multilateral institutions. And let me push everyone on the panel, including James. I mean, how do you see Russia's involvement on the Kosovo case in, in terms of helping the Serbian effort to contain the recognition campaign to fight back? And also, if you could spare a few words about Russia in Bosnia, Republika Srpska mm -hmm. Peace Implementation Council, 
and, and the, the rest of the more corruptible hardware that is, that is in place. I mean, Russia diplomatically has been really involved, so it's worthwhile hearing a bit more about the lessons learned <coughs> from Russia's experience. Thank you very much. Um, I see two more um, gentlemen there and gentlemen there. Hi there, Philip Merrill. Um, just touching upon the political influence of Russia in the Balkans, um, I mean, I think it's astonishing that if we look at opinion polls, um, Putin and Russia has very, I mean, specifically in Serbia, Putin has, has huge support. Certainly no, no other leader will get the reception that he did in that picture there. Um, on the other hand, we have a government which is clearly pro-European. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, all 250 members of parliament are pro-European. And um, those who sympathize with Russia, those who see Serbia's decision of pro-EU or EU membership versus cooperation with Russia, which is, let's face it, a perfectly acceptable dilemma to be having, a debate to be having in a country, um, they have been pushed to the extreme margins and are being represented by characters such as Vojislav Šešel, um, Vojz, um, Kustunica, who has, who has retired, and President Klitsch, who is on counting his days towards ret retirement. Um, how, what is the blame here? Has, has, has Russia failed the Balkan states by not feeding this underbelly when it was in desperate need of support throughout the 90s? Or, has there, or are there other, I won't say internal issues, perhaps manipulations of the political landscape which have allowed the elite and the entire political landscape to be pro-European? as opposed to what the opinions may show. And just another question um, to Nikolai. Um, coming into 2014, sorry to use the metaphor again, but coming into 2014, was, was Putin or was the, Putin, or was the power elite in Russia impotent? Was it in need of a Vagra to, 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 to maintain its support? To what extent wasn't it an, an internal issue or yeah, or, or, or looking for the, yeah, you got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, final point, uh, gentleman there. Thank you. Sure, yeah, Marco Gazek, uh, member of Chatham House. Um, really, I'm just, my question is this, are we, have we, has the West created a Russia whose foreign policy it fears by virtue of its own actions and the inconsistency of those actions? Because we've had two European crises, one is now in Ukraine, the previous one was uh, in Yugoslavia, which is not getting much of a mention. And in uh, the case of Yugoslavia, we had uh, the EU uh, committed to referendums uh, by secessionist rebellious republics, uh, forbidding the central government from taking any military measures whatsoever to stop that secession and recognizing the unilateral declarations of independence of those Yugoslav republics. And in the case of bits of Serbia, uh, the Kosovo province as well. Uh, whereas in the case of Ukraine, we have the central government allowed to run its fear all the way to the Russian border. Referenda in the Lugansk and Donetsk republics are viewed as entirely unacceptable, as are their unilateral declarations of independence. Isn't it a case that the Russians are bemused, puzzled, and scared by the inconsistency and self-interested nature of our own policies? Thank you very much. Well, um, again, uh, Quite a broad series of questions. I think I'll, I'll take a halt now. Maybe we can get one more round in. Um, Spencer, maybe you start this time. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Russia is this conflict resolution on, on Russia's agenda right now. I suppose Russia's a bit busy now, kind of sorting out more imminent issues when it comes to its own um, economy, its own relations with the West, and obviously uh, what goes on in Ukraine. But I take your point that um, apart from the violent conflict in the Balkans, Russia has not been necessarily as involved diplomatically or politically um, in the other political conflicts in, in the region. And um, I don't think it necessarily is, and obviously I'm not a Russia foreign policy specialist at all, I don't think it's part of how Russia sees its role in the region, in the Balkans, so it's kind of in, intervening in domestic affairs in that space. In that sense, it, it could use other, it has used other levers, such as its economic um, power um, to advance, to, to in sometimes promote certain political changes in, the, in, in certain countries in the region. Not necessarily the post-conflict ones, I would say, 
but in some other countries in the region where there was more space to use this economic <coughs> dependency and therefore kind of uh, influence how politics goes. But in the, I think the sense in which, say, the European Union uses um, its, its power to broker agreements and resolve certain political problems and crises that regularly pop up, especially in certain countries such as Bosnia or Macedonia, that's not the kind of conflict resolution that is on Russia's agenda, I would say. Demo on Russia's interest in Kosovo and Bosnia. As I said at the beginning, I tend to look at Russia's influence as overall contributing to a more balanced outcome. And um, simply because without Russia's um, participation in resolving this, we are coming up with solutions, and we can say this perhaps for Turkey as well, the, the solutions would have been much more one-sided than otherwise. Now, how much has this actually made them more sustainable in the longer term, or, has, or if it's made them more unstable just because they tend to be more of a compromise rather than an effective and efficient solution? It's open to, to, to questioning, but I would tend to see that the more inclusive the process of different interests on the ground and in the region, the better in the longer term. Um, uh, has Russia failed to feed the, the soft underbelly uh, in the Western Balkans? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. I, I don't think necessarily it's a matter of, I suppose if, if, if that had been an explicit goal uh, for, for Russia, it would have been a failure. But um, as I said earlier in the presentation, I don't think that Russia's initiatives in the region, especially after the conflicts were officially resolved, even though obviously a lot of problems still remain, was to be as engaged as some other actors. Now you compare it to, you know, all the MPs in Serbian parliament are now pro-EU, have voted in favor of, of EU membership, and that is because the EU has been trying for more than a decade now, since 2003, to engage this region and very closely through promises for EU membership, through visa liberalization uh, uh, measures, through economic aid and, and, and you know, other benefits and so on. So um, it's kind of not that surprising at the end of the day after um, su such efforts invested on behalf of the European Union to see this outcome at all. But I'm not sure that Russia was competing along the way um, in the same, with, you know, with the same purposes as the European Union was. So in that sense, um, it's probably uh, not a failure, but perhaps it was more, more or less intended or, or expected. And finally, <coughs> on, the, on the very, very uh, refreshing comment about EU's foreign policy having created um, Russian foreign policy, which is now fears. I suppose, I mean, I don't have really a kind of straightforward answer to that. Um, clearly, um, in the international relations, uh, basically, the foreign policies don't exist in isolation of each other. So it's inevitable that some, that you know, the, what what the West did in, in one region would influence what Russia does, and that therefore feeds back, and. Um, Obviously, you can make a similar case running the other way around, how much you know, uh, Russia's actions have actually form contributed to what we see as Western foreign policy now in the region. And, and that, I suppose, is true, but should have been taken into account anyway, and should be taken into account now when, when the West looks at what is going on in, in Ukraine and tries to make more sense of Russia's policy towards that. Thank you. I would start with uh, the logics of what happened in 2014 and with impotence of uh, Russia's political elites. Uh, usually it's taken for sure that, uh, uh, well, uh, the Orange Revolution as well as mass protests are very positive events because uh, their consequences are positive. I would say that 2014 in Russia is direct consequence of uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and of mass uh, protests uh, in Russia in 2011, 2012, uh, when it became uh, understandable for the Kremlin that uh, the uh, uh, 
legitimacy uh, is decreasing in spite of the victory uh, uh, of Putin in 2012 presidential elections and the very model of buying loyalty uh, didn't work in Moscow which used to be the place where this uh, uh, model was uh, used uh, most of all. Uh, uh, they felt political uh, need to switch to a different model and that's why the first logic is pretty understandable. It's political, how to increase legitimacy of the regime. The second logic is economic and it's rather understandable as well because what we do here, it's a kind of Putin oligarchic regime and at some point they did understand that they should either uh, make economy more open and let more competition uh, to uh, increase economic growth, but at the expense of losing their economic control monopoly, uh, or they should construct a fence, uh, uh, they should, uh, uh, well, separate uh, from uh, the Western world in order to keep their monopoly at the expense of economy. And their decision was pretty rational to keep monopoly of political and economic power at the expense of economy and this is exactly what uh, has happened in uh, 2014 and Ukraine and Crimea are uh, consequences of this decision. Uh, about Russia's uh, role in uh, solving uh, ethnic territorial conflicts in Balkans, Russia did play hardly in 90s uh, and the lesson learned was uh, that uh, the West uh, didn't uh, uh, take into account uh, Russia and Russia's position. And you do remember famous Primakov's U-turn in 1999. And there is a very interesting story recently published by Anatoly Adamishin, the first deputy uh, minister for foreign affairs at that time and very liberal uh, diplomat, uh, which uh, uh, shows that uh, position of liberals is not very different from position of hoax uh, in, in this certain uh, 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 case. And uh, after, after Russia failed in 90s, after it was uh, uh, considered to be too weak to play any serious role and to be listened uh, uh, by the West, it switched to a very different uh, policy, and uh, I would say that Crimea is perhaps the best way uh, to contain uh, uh, the process of recognition of Kosovo. And uh, I can hardly imagine uh, a European authorities to recognize uh, Kosovo uh, now, and uh, it seems to me that, well, it, this is pretty understandable. Russia is uh, directly connected to Kosovo, in a sense, European countries which did not recognize Kosovo do feel uh, the danger of this, uh, of this uh, case uh, uh, in connection to their uh, internal problems. So Russia itself is remainder of uh, the former Soviet empire. Uh, it does have a lot of ethnic territorial units and it cannot allow uh, uh, Kosovo to become uh, to become a model, just like Ukraine cannot allow now to uh, well for Kosovo to be used as a, as a model due to Crimea. Although comparisons are, are not uh, very direct here, so Russia feels itself being in a greenhouse, and that's why no re well this is not about Russian Serbian Brotherhood. This is about real threat for Russia to let uh, international <coughs> rules uh, to be revised in a way which will allow Russian ethnic republics uh, to proclaim their own sovereignty. By the way, when speaking about European crisis, I would add two wars in Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya is not considered to be part of Europe and uh, it was considered to be Russian domestic problem, but uh, it was a very bloody fight going on uh, in Europe in 90s. There were two serious wars. And uh, that's why, by the way, Russian political class is, uh, uh, does have certain reasons uh, not only to think about inconsistency of uh, the West position, but about hypocrisy of this position. Uh, at the time of uh, wars in Chechnya, Russia was not uh, applauded, uh, but uh, it was more or less supported by the West, and it was, by the way, a kind of bargain made. 
So Russia was allowed to do, Russian leadership was allowed to do whatever they wanted in Chechnya, and it was under Yeltsin, not under Putin, when the first bloody war took place, but uh, uh, at the expense of neglecting Russia's uh, uh, view in case of Balkans, in case of Kosovo, in case of Serbia, and, uh, and so on. That's why there are, the West uh, gave and gives Russia and Russian political class many reasons to uh, think and to say that not only uh, Western position is inconsistent, but uh, it's hypocritical. And unfortunately, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the case. And uh, uh, yeah, that's perhaps the... Um, we're almost out of time, but I do sort of feel that I must respond on, on, on the very interesting question about, um, about Kosovo recognition and, and what, what's happened. I mean, um, I will forever remember having a conversation with a, a very senior former British diplomat um, in 2008, this was before Abkhazia, when um, we were talking about um, the situation and the, the recent Kosovo Declaration of Independence. And um, this figure saying to me, what, what you've got to understand is that on matters of international law, Russia is an arch conservative. Um, it's incredible viewing it now from 2015 to consider um, that seven years ago that was exactly the case, that Russia always took the position, you know, very much in favour of multilateral institutions. It understood that that's where its strength lay, um, a, a staunch defender of international law. That reputation, let's face it, now lies in, 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 in the gutter. Um, it can't possibly make that claim. And I think it was very telling that... Um, one of the first instances we saw that it had lost that, that uh, any claim to a moral high ground um, came from remembering we now talk of the five EU non-recognisers, but it was actually a far more steady process um, moving from zero up to the current 23. And the, the, the last of the EU recognisers um, was Portugal. And Portugal had taken a very similar position to Spain. And it was actually very clearly, I, I remember looking at this in a lot of detail, it was after... Um, Russia's actions in Abkhazia and South Ossetia in, in August 2008, that the Portuguese simply said, look, you know, um, we wanted to take a, a, a position on this, but we can now see that, um, you know, the way that things are going, if we've got to cast our lot in, we're with the West, you know, we, we recognise our position, we're going to go with the EU, with NATO on this, um, you know, we, we can see that Russia's claim um, to be taking this high moral ground has is, is, is just been shot. Um, and I think, you know, now it... it, it it has become a complete joke. I mean, what can Russia do for Serbia to go to countries and say, well, you must respect international law and not recognize Kosovo? I mean, you know, who's going to possibly um, take that seriously these days? So I think in, it, it brings back to this point that was made earlier about tactical versus strategic. Um, I, I think, you know, Russia has scored a number of, 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 of tactical, tactical victories at certain points, but it's certainly lost the, the strategic battle on this. Um, and I think just really to, to simply say, to wrap it up, I mean, I think even for Serbia now, if, if one's to be very honest, the, the only real value um, that Moscow has is that one crucial vote on the Security Council. Um, you know, I think we all know that Serbia has effectively, you know, it'll say we're not going to recognize Kosovo, but I think, you know, we are very much in an end game scenario now and, and trying to work out what the final details of a, a, a final agreement will be between Belgrade and Pristina. Um, to sort out for the EU. I mean, many, many member states have made it clear that they expect recognition. You know, the EU position obviously isn't that, but, you know, Germany has been very clear on this. Um, but it's now that final vote, and I, I think in many ways that, you know, if we can find a way past that, then that is the last real political tie that links um, Belgrade to Moscow. Um, once that's gone, which raises in itself a very interesting question that, you know, could it be, and I think this is the point that you made, that even now, have we got to a situation that even if Serbia was willing to accept the independence of Kosovo, um, you know, Russia always said in the past it wasn't going to be more Serb than the Serbs, but maybe now it's, it, it's got no, no choice but to be more Serb than the Serbs. So, um, in actual fact, um, <laughs> sorry about a long intervention on my... Um, on Republic... You know, we hear a lot from Bosnia about claims of secession um, and that uh, they'll be supported by Russia, but it's just not going to happen. I mean, there is absolutely no way. Um, 
we can look at all these cases, secession only makes sense if you've got a patron state that really lies on one of your borders who can help you out. Um, if, if, he was, if Dodik was to declare independence, it would go absolutely nowhere. There is no way that Serbia has moved all this way on Kosovo and given up essentially its claim um, to then suddenly find itself completely isolated again by trying to recognize an independent Republic of Srpska. Um, and even if Russia was to say, yes, we recognize it, you know, where, where's it going to go? It's not going to get UN Security Council approval because the other four members aren't going to accept this. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it, it might be mischief making from Dodik, but I, I'd even be interested to know, maybe, unfortunately, run out of time, what the view from Moscow would be, because I, I, I could see that they recognize that maybe a bit of mischief making, but really it would, it would, it would cause more problems than it solves. Um, I'd love us for us to continue, but I think lunch is now beckoning. Um, we will return in 55 minutes um, for session three. Thank you very much.